Today we are kicking off a brand new series that's going to take us all the way through to Christmas time, a series called How to Make Good Decisions. Now, Pastor Will and I have been uh, planning this series for a while. We've been thinking about it, praying about it, and over the last couple of weeks especially, we sat in my office together and we were like, I'm a big whiteboard type of person with like different colors and arrows and we had illustrations and ideas and passages and thoughts and all these things scattered all over the place. And the one thing that we never really decided on was a name for the series. We knew what it was going to be about, how to make good decisions. And so, uh, you know, it was like, what do we do? And we just went into our document that we have, kind of here's where we're going. So the, you know, the staff and the board kind of know, hey, this is the direction. And we just put in how to make good decisions as a placeholder and thought, okay, that's fine. Here we go. We're planning, we're planning, we'll get back to it. Well, for two very, very creative guys, that was not a good decision. (laughs) We'll get back to it was not a good decision because the truth is, as we started moving into the season, we both became very decisioned out. We got to a place of being tired, not at what we were doing because we love what we do, but there's so many decisions you have to make that this was like, oh my gosh, what do we call this? And so we just left it instead of trying to come up with something more creative. Normally we're a bit more creative than that, but we just left it. Why? Because we were a little bit tired, tapped out. Have you ever found yourself in that place before? You're just decisioned out? Please tell me I'm not alone in this. Okay. Colin, thanks, man. Right? You have so many choices that you have to make throughout the day. There's so many things on your plate that you just couldn't decide what you want to do. So your decision was not to decide. Anybody been there? All right, cool. Um, There's a great uh, philosopher group. They call themselves Rush. And they have this great thing to say that if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice, right? This is a great old band, Brush, and they said, man, you can choose not to decide, but you still have made a choice. And and, and it's true, right? Every day in our personal lives, let's just be real, we're making tons of decisions. Some aren't conscious decisions. They're just, you know, easy things and you just, they're not hard. When I was in college and didn't have a lot of money at all, and like, the, the question at night when I wanted ramen was, do I want chicken ramen or beef ramen? Right? That, that's my choice. Not what do I want. This is my choice. It's, it's easy. If you don't have things filling your fridge and you have leftovers from last night, when you open your fridge, what are you going to have? Leftovers. It's, this is easy, right? You don't really have to make that choice. But then there's decisions that we have to make that do involve a little bit more, like if there is the capacity to choose, what do we eat? What do we wear? What, what, what time do we need to leave? How do I need to lie about that so everybody's on time? Anyway, oh, good. You know you have late people in your family too. Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, what's my plan going to be for the day? This one starts to vex us, especially if we have a day off. What am I going to do with my day off? I've got to fill it with all these things. What am I going to do? You know, the, the average person, at least the American Medical Association says, the average person consciously and unconsciously makes about 35,000 decisions a day. 35,000 decisions before they go to bed. That could be absolutely draining. Mentally, emotionally, doctors have come to call this inability to make decisions decision fatigue. It has been around a very long time, and I like Dr. Lisa McLean. Um, She's a member of the AMA. She says this, the more choices you have to make, the more it can wear on your brain, and it may cause your brain to look for shortcuts. There are four main symptoms, procrastination, impulsivity, avoidance, and indecision. I I know I've experienced every one of these when I'm tired, and when one more decision comes to me, I I I throw my hands up and I just kind of say sometimes, like, you know what, I don't know, I don't care. Just pick whatever. Just, just do it. I don't care. What do you want for dinner? I don't care. That type of decision, you'll survive. It's not going to impact you. But at the same time, it's not so true when a decision comes across that we need to give our full attention to. And then when you choose not to decide, it could have destructive consequences in your life. There's a lot of decisions we abnegate and let other people make for us 
that destroy us. And we've done it because we're so tired. Listen, this tension, if you're feeling this right now, I want to tell you this is not new. This has been around forever, that, that the weight of our decisions have consequences, and we really want to make it worth it, but we're tired of making them. This may not come as a surprise to you, but Jesus loved his people enough and his followers enough to address how to make good decisions, how to choose and prioritize what's right, because it's going to impact every decision you make. And it simply starts with prioritizing the kingdom of God. If we want to begin to make good decisions in our life, if we want to, want to really know what matters, it's, it's going to be really hard to make it in the moment. And so what we have to do is begin to prioritize the kingdom of God. And if you have your Bibles with you today, I would love for you to uh, start with me in Matthew's biography of Jesus. We'll look at chapter 6. And what's uh, great about chapter 6, this is 5, 6, and 7 are what's called the Sermon on the Mount. And this is Jesus' teachings, basically the, the Cliff's Notes version of everything that Jesus lives out and teaches could be found in these three chapters. And it is amazing. He hit it's all sorts of topics that we have to make decisions about, right? He hits topics like, how and when should I be praying? What's that look like? Should I be fasting? How do I understand the law and these instructions that God has given us? How do I deal with, with these temptations to anger or to lust? What am I supposed to do with that? Then he teaches us, what, what should I do about practical things like divorce, or dealing with my enemies when I want to take revenge on them and I'm so pissed and what do I do, God? And he's like, oh, I've got, I've got some wisdom for that, how to help you decide what to do. He spends a lot of time on decisions that absolutely overwhelm us and that's on our money and our possessions, how they can get a grip on us and how we're supposed to interact with us. He, he, he really knows this is going to grip us. I mean, any one of these areas could be a lot to handle, right? Any one of these, we have some big choices to make. But when you list them all together, I don't know about you, it feels very overwhelming. It's like, oh, what am I supposed to do with this? And one of the things I love about Jesus is, is when I read uh, what he says and what he teaches, I do everything I can to uh, make sure I remember he's 100% human. Yes, 100% God, but he's 100% human, and he loved people. And I imagine that, that there are times like this when he starts to teach, and he starts to lay this out for his listeners, and his listeners give a look of like, what? How am I supposed to do all that? That's overwhelming. I, I've seen that face from you guys sometimes when I uh, begin to teach and go, wait a second, I, I didn't explain that right. How do I sum this up better? That wasn't right. I'm sure that Jesus experienced this. So in his grace and in his goodness, about two-thirds of the way through, I think he saw this. And I think he loved his people enough that he said, you know what, let me, let me summarize this for you. And in verse 33, he says, but seek first his kingdom. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things, talking about all these things that I've just unpacked for you, all these decisions that you've got to make, oh, how do I handle it? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things are going to be given to you as well. I have got you covered, but like, all right, I know that's a lot to think about. You can't create a plan for all of those areas, but you can start by prioritizing the kingdom. This is where we have to start. And this one statement summarizes Jesus' entire life and his approach to decision-making. This is how he looked at the entire world that he lived in. This is how he looked at the people that he was with. For him, life revolved around seeking to see God's kingdom come and seeking his Father's righteousness. He spent time with God. He spent time with people, and he wanted to see these combined. And what's awesome is you see that this even impacts when he talks about praying in verse 10. We also know this as the Lord's Prayer. We, 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 we pray this often together, and you can repeat it and fire through it. But one of the first things that Jesus tells us to pray about was to ask God, may your kingdom come and your will be done. When you want to begin to pray, it starts with God's kingdom, not your requests. It starts with God's kingdom. That's one of the first things he teaches in chapters 5, 6, and 7. It, oh my goodness. Lord, teach us to pray. Okay, let's just start with remembering God's kingdom is the most important thing. Then seek his face and his righteousness. Ask for his will to be done. 
right? This was on the mind of Jesus all the time. It impacted what he decided to do, who he decided to do it with, where he decided to go, when he decided to stay somewhere or go somewhere else. The decisions that he made every single moment started with seeking God, seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. That was his lens. I love that about 30 years later, the Apostle Paul is trying to explain a little bit of this idea to the church that's in Rome, this church that is, that is divided, and now they're having to make decisions on what it means to come together. How do we get back together since we were apart for a little while, and now traditions are different, and, and we're, if we're going to live together, this is going to be a hot mess together. And, and sometimes I love the read, readings of Paul so much because he is taking what Jesus says, and he even begins to try to make it as practical as he can for the church to say, this is the overarching theme of what Jesus says. Now, this is how it could work out for you. Let's put this into practice. And so here's what he says. You want to figure out how to figure out what God's will is for you to come together? What God's will is for you personally and as a church? Well, Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, by testing, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. What is good and acceptable and perfect? Paul understands that we all have battles with figuring out what God's will is. You can take it for what it's worth. I don't think God cared if I ate chicken or beef rum. I, I just don't think he cared. But there are decisions that I need to know what God's will is. And he deeply cares. How am I supposed to to know what to do because the truth is I'm a part of this world and there are patterns in this world that become normal to me. Things that, that, that are, I am used to. This is just the world that we live in. That's just the way it is. And so uh, it's easy to conform to patterns of this world. I think of how we handle conflict as a culture. As a culture, we have a pattern. I mean, the first thing that you could do is if you hit conflict, ah, we freak out, but conflict's everywhere. We, we deal with this all the time, right? Please tell me it's not just me or I'm the one who's in conflict with everybody here. Right? We have conflict. You're in conflict, correct? Okay, great. We talk back and forth. This is how we do things, okay? We're in conflict. The patterns of our world simply say, one of them is, avoid it and run away. Any avoiders and runawayers? Yeah, all right, cool. Yeah, this makes sense. I've done this. I, I do this sometimes. It's like, oh, this is easier not to make a choice, so I'm going to run and not deal with this. Or we have the approach of conflict where we rally our troops. We make sure we start to justify where we are, and we surround ourselves with people who are going to justify where we are. And then they're like, yeah, that person is the worst. And you're like, yeah. You didn't want to tell them that full thing, but you told them enough to make sure they're on your side. So if you got to go into battle, you got your army. So we got our builder-uppers to justify ourselves. Anybody like that? Okay, cool. See, I see the same hands. Perfect. We're together then. This is what we do. And, and, or we've got the, wait a second. I'm in conflict, but I need to protect my image. Maybe it's with someone at work. It's in a marriage. It's with your kids. And it's like, I don't want anybody to find out about this. I don't want anybody to know, so I'm going to start to assert control in this situation by either completely shutting them down so that... If I shame them enough, they won't speak out. Or, in our culture, what we do, specifically through social media, is we put someone on blast, and we just put them up on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, and we start to hate on them without ever addressing it with them. But we make sure everybody knows how wrong they are. Yeah, it's kind of a version of rallying, but it's also a form of control to protect our image publicly. I don't want to be shamed, so I'm going to shame first. And so then, if that's our choices, I won't ask how many do that, but if that's our choices, we're left going, what do I choose to do? Do I choose to run away? Do I choose to build an army? Do I choose to attack first? What do I choose? And then when we read scripture and we read what Jesus teaches us about conflict, because conflict happens, and he, he talks about it in Matthew 18, none of these choices are offered by Jesus. All our cultural patterns and choices aren't offered by Jesus, so we have a choice to make. Instead, he, he says, you know what? You start by seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and that starts by going to that person one-on-one. -on -one. 
Oh, there's nothing worse than when the worldly patterns that we've gotten used to clash with kingdom principles, right? We're going to have to make a decision in that moment. What are we going to do? Are we going to stick to the patterns of this world or are we going to stick to what Jesus says? Do we do what we want or do we do what Jesus says? Because what we want is going to be the normal that we're used to. When we read the teachings of Jesus, it is uncomfortable and it pushes against us because it is not the patterns of this world. We have lots of choices in the world and there are so many patterns and so we really only have one option with Jesus. Follow my teaching. Seek first his kingdom. Seek his righteousness. And what Paul is telling the church here is like, listen, worldly principles and patterns are going to clash with kingdom values. And you're going to have to renew your minds. You're going to have to be thinking about this intentionally, letting God's word sit on your brain over and over and over so that when you're in that situation, you would actually be able to know what God's good, pleasing, and perfect will is. You've got to lock into what he wants because it's going to be really hard to do it if it's not soaking on your brain. It's easy to conform to the patterns of this world. The only battle we have against it is renewing our minds because there's a battle, isn't there, in our choices? There is a battle. Please tell me you don't feel this alone, right? It, it sounds silly, but it reminds me of a scene from a movie that... Uh, any, any Indiana Jones fans? Okay, good. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade uh, is, is a movie that I love sitting and watching. I laugh a lot, and I usually like to laugh as my wife laughs at certain scenes, and I know where she's going to laugh ahead of time, and I begin to laugh early knowing she'll giggle, and it's fun. If you've ever watched the third movie, this is a movie where Sean Connery plays Indiana Jones's dad. Indiana Jones is an ar uh, archaeological guy. Um, I was going to say architect. That's not true. Uh, he digs for things that have since been destructed. Uh, constructed, but he's on his uh, task, his dad, to find the, the Lord's cup, the chalice that was used at the Last Supper. And so his dad dedicates his life to finding this, and the whole movie is about his dad going after it, then him trying to save his dad going after it, because ultimately in all the Indiana Jones movies, at least the early ones, the Nazis are going to get it first. That's what it comes down to. So they've got to find it. What's funny is Indiana does not believe that it's real. He thinks it's all made up, but his dad is dedicated his life to it, even has a journal with all the written things that he has found and commands to follow to get to it. So ultimately, they arrive at the Grail's location, okay? They arrive at the Grail's location, and it it's, was filmed in a place called Petra that we're used to. Uh, that's a place over in Jordan. And this is the treasury in Jordan. There's nothing inside there. So if you watch the movie, it's not what's inside. There is no night in there, okay? But the Nazis get there at the same time that Indiana and all his friends are there. And the, the, the task is to get to the Grail, but the Nazis keep sending people into get the cup, but they keep dying. They keep dying. And, and finally, when Indiana gets there, they're like, oh, we need to get there, but you're the only guy who's going to be able to do this. And so they force him by shooting his dad and saying, he's sick, now you got to go get the cup because it'll heal him, to go and do this. So Indiana takes his dad's journal, and he has to tackle the test to get in. The first te test is the breath of God, where it was about humbling yourself. You had to kneel before God in prayer. And if you did not, that's when the giant saw came across, and that's where all the heads were rolling across. And you're like, oh, oh, you've heard, read the Bible, there's way worse stuff in there. You're like, oh, I can't believe you said that. Just read it, there's way worse stuff in here. The second test was understanding the word of God. And he, you had to know the name of God and the language that it was written. And you had to step on the right letters. And if you stepped on the wrong letter, it, it, you, know, you fell to your death. The third test was called the path of God. And this was about faith where you saw this huge chasm that, and, and a ledge on the other side. And you had to trust that when you stepped off down below you about a foot and a half or two feet, the bridge was actually there, even though you couldn't see it. So you had to take a step of faith. And, and so Indiana actually passes all of these tests using his dad's journal. And then the one test that he never knew was going to be there, he walks into the chamber where night is guarding the grail except it's not the grail, it's the grails. There are dozens and dozens of versions all over the place. And before he had an opportunity to ask what was going on or to choose, the Nazis take all the work that Indiana did, 
They follow right behind him, and the villain of the movie, a man named Walter Donovan, steps in to steal the cup, and this is what happens. wisely, for as the true grail will bring you life, the false grail will take it from you. I'm not a historian. I have no idea what it looks like. Which one is it? Let me choose. says very clearly the true grail will bring you life the false grail will take it from you it's kind of a big decision when you agree literally a life and death decision here I will spare you the images but I will tell you he dips the cup in the water to drink it and he begins in the truest Indiana Jones 1989 fashion to waste away as his life is stolen from him and he turns into complete dust. This is what the knight has to say about that and then how Indiana Jones responds. He chose poorly. Gold. That's the cup of a carpenter. There's only one way to find out. Jesus from his dad talking about him all the time. Eventually, even though he didn't fully believe it at the time, he had to exercise faith in what was given to him and to know that in the right time, this is going to make a difference. And what's great is he didn't even want the cup for himself. He wanted it for his dad. And the knight looks at him and says, you have chosen wisely, wisely. Can I tell you, I dream about Crossbridge being a place that chooses wisely, that we make great choices individually, in our life groups, as a church collectively. But I realize that most of our life has been riddled with decisions that have been made poorly. But I don't think it has to stay this way. I don't think it has to be this way. We have to have a plan if we're going to make wise decisions. We cannot just wait for a decision to come and go, I'll, I'll figure it out when I get there. That's not seeking first the kingdom of God. That's reacting to what's going on. And so to close our time in the word today, what I would like to do is just give you a simple plan. To, to give you a plan, some five steps to a plan on how to make good decisions. Some of these you're not going to be able to implement when a decision comes because that's already too late. 
But what is something that we can do to prepare ourselves to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? How, what steps can we take in good, healthy decision-making? And then Pastor Will and I, over the next couple of weeks, are going to be putting this into practical terms for us. How do we take this? So if you're like, oh, he flew through those things. Yes, because we're going to be looking at them over and over and over together. Are you with me? So the first step, if you want to make wise decisions, is to pause. Pause. One of the wisest kings and men who ever lived, King Solomon, in the book of Proverbs that he wrote down for his kids to follow, says this. This is some of his wisdom. In chapter 19, verse 2, he says, Enthusiasm without knowledge is no good. Haste makes mistakes. We need to give some of these bigger decisions that come across our, our lives some space to breathe. Some of them are really, really big. And, and sometimes a decision comes our way that we're so excited about and we get so pumped about, we're like, ah, here we go, but we've done no homework and we think it's the greatest thing in the world. And we're ready to dive in and our enthusiasm has completely blinded us that we don't know anything about what's going on. Oh, but the car looks so good. You don't know anything about it, but it doesn't matter. I like it. Your enthusiasm without knowledge, knowing it's been in four accidents, could be your downfall, right? Knowledge is key here. So enthusiasm is great. But if you rush a decision, you're in trouble. But I also know that we live in a culture that's too fast for our brains to process sometimes, right? It just is. We're, we're forced to make decisions Split second, like, you, all right, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? And people rush us. Have you ever felt rushed to make a decision? Yeah, there is nothing worse than that. They push us or we push ourselves to make decisions too fast. And let me just give you a simple principle. This is not a biblical wisdom, but more practical that I've learned, is that a rushed yes is rarely a good yes. Okay, just think about it. It's not coming up on the screen. Nothing. A rushed yes is very rarely a good yes. This, you think about it. What should I spend on? If you've got to make an immediate decision, yes or no on that, the answer is probably going to be no. Don't rush and spend your money. Should I become sexually active with this person or go this far or do that or drink this or smoke? Th if the answer is pressured and you've got to make it now or it's no good, guess what? Start with no good. A rushed yes is rarely going to be a beneficial yes in our life. If we are pushed into making a decision, especially by someone else, do not let their pressure stop you from your pause. Okay? Don't let people pressure you. You have got to learn to pause. And when you pause, we can put into practice a great way to do this is what Psalm 46.10 tells us. And it's this great reminder to be still and know that I'm God. We have this all over things that we print as Christians. It's one of those great things that fits on a journal, a cup, a bumper sticker. And it's like, be still and know that I'm God. Great, but it's a green light. Go. Listen, when you're pausing, I use this verse often as a prayer to slow me down. And I will take this prayer, be still and know that I'm God, and I will repeat it. And I'll practice it, and I'll begin to pray it by taking one word off of the verse each time, and I'll start by saying, be still and know that I am God, and I'll sit on it. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know that I. Be still and know that. Can I tell you, just doing this now together, I already feel a difference in this room. It's slowed down. This is a gift from God to slow us down. We need to pause. The second step that we have to make is to read. This is the second step, is to read. Yes, for those of you who are readers, you're like, yeah! Um, this is really important. We are not a culture of readers, and that has become, we are the most intelligent or intellectually unintelligent group ever as Christians. We know less about our faith than any group that has followed Jesus in history, and we have more content than ever. But I'm reminded of what Jesus says, or what, not what Jesus says, but what the psalmist says in Psalm 19, 119. 
that giant long psalm that took four days to read together in our soaping. In verse 105, it says, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Listen, we need light to reveal what is next in our path. God, what should I do in this moment? I am asking for your light. Guess where that light comes from? Right here. This is our light. This is our starting point. This is our foundation. What what does the kingdom of God even look like? It's in here. It's right here. This is where we start. But you know what the problem is? Is that a lot of times we have sin in our life that clouds our decision making. And we want what we want. And so we're going to do it even though we know God says something else. And and it just sin makes things confusing for us. It makes things hard. Have you ever looked back at a poor decision that you've made in life and asked yourself the question, why in the world did I do that? How could I have ever thought that was a good idea? My life is filled with these stories. If you ever want to sit and like compare them, I would love to hear yours too to know I'm not alone. Right? What was I thinking? How could I think that was a good idea? Well, it's easy to think that's a good idea. You know why? Because sin clouded my judgment. The sin that I wanted to hold on to so tightly and say, it's but uh, what I want. It didn't allow me to hear anything that the people around me or that God was saying. One of the best things about the Bible is that it is convicting. I know some people want to avoid it for that purpose, but I love it. Because the psalm says here that it's a light for our path. This isn't just telling us what decision that we should make. What the Bible does is it teaches us about how we should approach things, and it reveals our heart. Like I said, God doesn't care about chicken or beef ramen. God doesn't care if you have an, uh, an Apple or an Android. You may debate over those things, but God doesn't care. What God cares about is the condition of your heart when you're making it. It will teach you about who you are and reflect that. And what we need to understand is we have to read the fullness of Scripture, not just the pieces that we want, not just the pieces that are convenient for us. I would love to skip some of the Old Testament major prophets. They're really tough. But they're a gift to us because the, Jesus cared about them, so we should care about them. And this needs diving into Scripture and reading it really needs to be a regular practice because, well, let's be real, when you've got a rushed decision in front of her, you've got something difficult, you're sitting at the lunch table and you're ready to snap back at somebody across the table, are you really going to stop and be like, hold on, let me pause, be still? No, you're not doing that. Are, are you going to sit there and be like, hold on, hold on? Actually, that's not true. I don't have my phone on me, but you could pull out your phone and be like, hold on, we'll Google it. You're not going to do that. None of us will. This is why we have to read Scripture and allow it to be shaping our hearts and conforming us into the image of Christ. So it's around when we need it most and we don't have it with us. Psalm 1 tells us this. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join with the mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. If we want to make wise decisions, let me tell you, we need to be men and women who delight in the law of the Lord, get excited about it, who meditate on it day and night. How, how can we ever dream about seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness first if we have no idea what that even is? We have to start in Scripture. Are you with me? We start with that second step. We pause, then we read. And the third step is to ask, is to ask. Again, King Solomon in Proverbs 15, he says that plans go wrong for lack of advice. Many advisors bring success, right? Let's just be real. People impact our decisions a lot, don't they? Right? People matter in our decisions. We, we care about people, but also they impact and they say, well, I think you should. I think you should. And, and that's good. That's good. People do impact us. So we know then the best thing that we could do is surround ourselves with wise people. Surround yourself with wise people to ask. If you look at the people right around you now, think about your group of friends in school or on that sports team. Think about your group of friends that you hang out with at work or that you hang out with on Friday night or that you find yourself around. The people that you kind of gather with on Facebook and you guys do your thing. Think about the people that are there right now, have their faces and their names in mind because I will tell you that you will begin to do the same things as the people around you because they impact you. And you impact them, yes, but if you find that most of the people around you do nothing but grumble and complain, guess what you will do? You will grumble and complain. If you look at the decisions that they make and be like, that was dumb. 
If you have to say that for more than like a handful of your closest friends, you need new friends. Because you will begin to make dumb decisions because when you don't know what to do, who are you going to ask? Them. And you know their decision-making pattern. Don't do it. Sometimes I think we ask the wrong people. What, about I, what I love about this step of having to ask people, and specifically wise people, is it forces us to do two things. Number one, it forces us to pause. Can you catch a theme in our decision-making process? It makes us pause, right? We need time to get advice. And for the big ones, don't post it on Facebook. What should I do? You don't need their wisdom. The second thing that asking causes us to do is to humble ourselves. It forces us to humble ourselves. It means you need to recognize, and I need to recognize, that we don't know everything. We are not omniscient. We are not God. God is omniscient. He knows all things. We are not. We're flawed. We've got giant blind spots, which is why we read and we seek his divine wisdom. But we don't have all of that, and we need to grow in that. And we need to lean on the people around us who have wisdom. One of the lessons I continue to try to teach my son, I think it's important for all my kids, but specifically because he's growing into a man in our culture, and it's the very thing I wish I was taught, is that simply the strongest thing a man can do is ask for help. The strongest thing a man can do is ask for help because we don't want to ask for help. We want to be self-sufficient. We want to put it together. We want to be able to the ones who could do this. I've got, guess what? No, you can't. You can't. I can't. We all have limits and we cannot do everything alone. It's just not going to work that way. When we think that we're the only one who can do it, let me tell you what that leads to. It leads to burnout and bad decisions. You're exhausted and the decisions that you make leave a trail of people behind you because you're fried and then you're wondering, well, why won't anybody help me? Did you even ask? And no, people can't read your mind. That's my sin is when I'm in struggle, I don't always tell my family and my friends because I'm like, if they really love me, they'd figure it out. You dummy, they do love you. They're just not that smart because you're an idiot sometimes. Tell them you need help. Listen, you can't do this. Ask for help. Ask for it. That's the third step. The fourth step in making a wise decision is to yield. It's to yield. Jesus modeled this for us very clearly in the Garden of Gethsemane. We find him at the verge of, of going to the cross, and this is how he prays in chapter 22, verse 42. He says, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. You see, Jesus had his desire and that it, was, it wouldn't go this way. I think it's really important to remember that. It's not like, oh, he willingly went to the cross. Yes, he did this out of obedience. He yielded to God's will. But his desire is if there's any other way to do this, I'm down for that. Any other way, I'm in. But God, this is really about what you want, not what I want. Why? Because he seeks first his kingdom and his righteousness. That's what ultimately every decision he makes boils down to. And let me tell you, when, when, when we pray like this and we yield to God, it takes time. And we just don't think like God, so we need his wisdom. And we need to understand like, when he asks us for something and he wants this from us, this is what we do. When we don't hear God or we think that he doesn't hear us, let me tell you, this is a season where God is teaching you trust. Do you really believe he is who he says he is? Can you find trust in him when you feel like your prayers are hitting the ceiling and going nowhere? He doesn't hear me. He doesn't care. I've been praying for this for years and nothing's changed. Do you trust him more though? Or have you given up? This doesn't mean he does not care. We just sang about it. You are chosen. You are not forsaken. God has not abandoned you. It may feel like that, but he has not. We need to yield to what he wants. And it is so often against the patterns of this world that we want. And the final step that we make in this decision-making process is to pray. It's to pray. 
And what's great is if you are taking notes, you can circle the first letter of the first four steps to pause, to read, to ask, and to yield, and you're going to come up with what's your fifth step, is to pray. You see, prayer is part of every single one of these. And I know some of you are probably thinking like, but Jimmy, you didn't say pray. You didn't say pray. Listen, prayer is the act of pausing. Prayer is found in the act of, you know, reading. Prayer is part of our asking and our yielding. And that's why I can believe in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, when the command is never stop praying. I always looked at that and I was like, that's not realistic. Sometimes I have to pee. I'm going to stop, right? Like sometimes I got to break. Sometimes I'm going to sleep. Sometimes I'm going to... That's not what this is saying. It's saying. Whatever you're doing at all times, it's part of your prayers, part of being in union with God saying, I need to pause and, and read and ask and yield and don't stop because you don't get an answer. We need to be persistent in our prayer. And I will tell you the way that you know that God is moving is if you experience peace. You see, peace is the very thing that Paul writes in Colossians 3 when he says, and the peace of Christ will rule in your hearts. If you have been torn about a decision and you find yourself at peace about it after pausing, reading, asking and yielding, and you are at peace, this is one of the clearest signs of God's will in your life. It doesn't mean it's easy. Please hear me on that but his will will always bring peace. It will always bring peace. Now, as we close our time in this, I want to just tell you that this has been part of the fabric of Crossbridge recently. And one of the reasons that we wanted to do this series on how to decide is because the last season, God has been calling the board and the elders into some tougher decision-making process. I hear often like, oh, you've been a portable church for how long? And oh, wow. And when you get a building and grow up, and it's like, what are you talking about? This is the church. And we love who we are and who we're becoming. Well, when are you going to get a building? For what? Most of the things that we want to do, we can already do. I'm not worried about this. And for over, I've been here 12 years, for almost 11 and a half of them, I've been the biggest guy to say, I don't want to ever have a building. But a couple of months ago, I felt a different prompting, and I was like, I don't like that. I like who we are. And so I paused for a long time. I don't want to share any of that. I read, God, what do you want? It wasn't clear. And so I moved to my step of ask. And so I asked our elders, guys, I'm feeling this, and I don't know what this is. I don't know if this is from God or frustration or what. I I just don't know. I mean, is it like we moved stupid rooms three times in a year? I don't want to do that. Wait, if it's born out of that, I don't want to do this. But if this is what God's doing, it terrifies me at the same time. What do you think? And so do you know what the elders did? We paused. We fasted. We prayed and we asked God for wisdom. What do we do? And we all felt peace. I'm not saying I think God is up to something here. We don't know what it is, but he's up to something. And so then we brought the board into it. Guys, we need your help here. We're discerning this, but we want to see if this is, this is even realistic. Like, we don't know what's going on, but, but we need, we're doing this together. And so we brought our board on to this. What, what's happening now? What's, what's God doing? And we paused and we fasted and we prayed. We had a retreat where we prayed over every single person in our church because you are what matters to God most not a building, but in that time, God revealed something to us. That it didn't matter where a building was, because a building was never the issue. It was ministry to the people at Crossbridge, and it was time to begin to look for a ministry center, to look for a place that would be home away from home. This is home for us. It has been for, for almost two decades. I love this home. And as we have began to journey, we've began to say, what do we do? And so we've yielded to God's will. And I need to tell you, there's now a place where we've done our due diligence on a lot of levels, and there's a piece of property we're looking at. And that property has a building on it that we believe God has opened up a bit of opportunity for us to do ministry through that never compromises our Sunday mornings. This is home for us. This is home. 
where we gather together to worship. This is home for our teenagers on a Sunday night. I think two weeks ago, there was 80 teenagers flooding this place. This is the only type of building that will sustain that and not be torn down. Praise God that he's given us this gift. Amen? Amen. But we also know a time and a season of ministry is coming to the community around us where we need to know that there's a home away from home where we gather. Two homes. Home here and home there. This decision has not been made over a couple of weeks. This has been about six months of discerning. Do you know that? Six months of discerning. Because it's a decision that mattered. And if it was made flippantly, what good is that? But you're going to hear a lot more about that. I know you probably have a ton of questions, and that's good. Um, I'm just going to sprinkle that out there for you now. We'll talk about it a lot more in two weeks um, and, and stuff like that. But I need to tell you now, we're heading in a direction where we feel God is saying it's time to root in addition to this space. I'll be the first to tell you it's uncomfortable for me because I think something's expected of me as a leader that I'm not really comfortable with. I don't know if I could do this, but I've never had more peace in my life about what God's doing. That's why I know it's right. That's why I know he's moving. Where are you wrestling? Where have you said yes to things too soon or no to things because it was uncomfortable? It'll never lead you to wise decisions. May the Lord give you wisdom. Would you stand with me as we prepare our hearts for communion? At Crossbridge, we celebrate communion every single week because everything we do is about taking steps towards Jesus and communion is an extension of that where we have to step out of our chairs to walk to receive the body and blood of Christ together. And it culminates every one of our services because if this is not about Jesus, it doesn't matter what decision we make. If this is not about seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness, it just doesn't matter what we do. What a gift God has given us in remembering him every week together. That that Crossbridge is not about whether it's here or there. It's not about who's leading and who's not. Crossbridge is about Jesus. It will be, always be, will, will always be about Jesus. And that's what we have to be about, seeking first his kingdom. If you have given your life to Christ and saying, you win, you are my Lord and my Savior, and and I will do all I can to submit to your teachings, then we would welcome you to take communion with us. Regardless of what tradition you're from, if you have trusted Christ, we do this together. But if there's something you feel like that's blocking you right now, and you're like, this is killing me, and and I'm carrying this weight and this shame, and I don't know what to do with this, you just take a moment and confess that to God. He forgives you. He forgives you. Just hear that. He forgives you because you are chosen and not forsaken. You are forgiven. And then we'll take communion together, and as we close our service, if there's something that's sitting so heavy, a decision that keeps coming up in your brain that's like, I cannot get rid of this. This is killing me. And you are carrying that. Um, Just come over to the side. We will pray over you and ask the Lord to give you just a release from that guilt and shame because there are decisions that we carry. God can redeem all things, amen? That's the hope we find around the table. Jesus, we offer ourselves to you because you offered yourself for us. We give ourselves to you. If there is sin, would you reveal it, Lord, so that we can confess it, not with any shame, attached to it, but hope and peace. Yes, Jesus. At this time, I'd like to invite you to go. You can grab a cracker, grab a cup, tip it. We'll come back together and receive the body of Christ.